My name is Joe Nagy and I have the privilege of chairing this meeting. The topic today, as most of you know, is Dirty Secrets, our ASIO files. We are privileged, as I said before, to have two expert speakers on the subject, Dr. Meredith Bergman and Dr. David McKnight. Thanks very much, Meredith. Um, as Meredith said, I contributed a chapter to the book on the overall context of ASIO's activities during the Cold War and some material about how to interpret your file, how to read it, all its codes and abbreviations. And I wrote that chapter on the basis of research I've done on and off over the last 20 years or so, and I wrote a book um, 20 years ago called Australia's Spies and Their Secrets. It covered the first 25 years of ASIO's existence from its founding under Ben Chifley uh, in 1949 to the period under the Whitlam Labor government in, in 1972 to 75. I based the book on interviews with about 30 former ASIO officers, as well as releases from uh, under the Archives Act, which Meredith has mentioned. And just as an aside, I'd like to reflect for a moment on the value of the Archives Act, because the, apart from anything else, contributors to this book uh, made, were able to look back in time using their ASIO files. The Archives Act is a, a tr truly remarkable uh, bit of law about freedom of information. It was prepared under the Fraser government, uh, enacted under the Hawke years. It's not perfect by any means, but I don't think there can be too many societies on earth which allow people to read their files uh, produced by a security agency 20 or 30 years later. And I think it's a small but important mechanism for democracy. Important to say that because ASIO has tried several times since the Act came into, into power in, in early, the early 80s, tried several times to effectively annul uh, the Archives Act as it applied to them. Uh, I won't go into the details, but, but those sort of gains are, are under, under threat, uh, always under threat by an organisation like that. When I first visited the National Archives in Canberra, I was intrigued by the unlikely uh, people who had ASIO dossiers in a bit in the same way as Meredith has, has outlined. They included uh, historian Professor Manning Clark, the artist Lloyd Rees, the boxer Jimmy Carruthers, people may remember him many, many years ago, he's a wharfie, uh, the Labor MP Jim Cairns, who was the leader of the Labor left, and the novelist uh, Christina Stead. They were all regarded as communist sympathisers of one kind or another. And after a while, after I'd got over my indignation about them having files, I realised in a way this was not surprising because one of the great advantages of the Communist Party of Australia was that it was surrounded by a periphery of sympathisers and supportive non-members. As well, all kinds of intellectuals, artists, politicians and others had joined the CPA at some stage in their lives. So when ASIO came along and tried to, as a as it did, tried to open a file and identify all possible members of the Communist Party of Australia, as well as its supporters, their relatives, and even people who had expressed supposedly communist opinions, it had actually set itself this impossible task. Uh, that's one of the reasons you get files which are quite bizarre, uh, that, that they, because they believed you know, it was possible for for undercover members of the Communist Party to exist here, there and everywhere, they had to tr track down, according to their own logic, they had to track down every single person, including relatives and so on. During the years of research I did on ASIO, I, I found a number of interesting, fascinating tales that I'd like to share tonight. One of the highlights of the period when I was doing this research was that I dug up plans for the mass internment of communists. I'd heard uh, rumours when I was writing the book about the Menzies government, uh, its plans to round up communists and place them in internment camps in the event of World War III. So I requested, without much hope in my heart, I requested archival documents on this, and sure enough, these plans did exist. So when it, the plan was, when, when it became clear that World War III was in the offing, and, and of course this was not, we can laugh, because this was taken terribly seriously and in a sense rightly so. Uh, in the, from the 50s right up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, a, a possible World War III was, was uh, on the cards. So the plan was on the eve of World War III, ASIO, backed by military intelligence and the state police, had a plan to raid the homes of leading communists 
simultaneously around Australia and put them and their families, of course you couldn't leave the families out, uh, in internment camps. In 1955 this amounted to 11,000 people. Uh, and of course World War III didn't happen, thank God, and these plans lay in dusty archives for, for many, many decades, but they were continually updated uh, and they were only finally abandoned in the early 1970s. That really struck me as extraordinary. As it has its own kind of crazy logic, because of course in World War II people were interned, and enemy aliens, blah, blah, blah. It all has this, as I say, strange logic. Of course, when you read these archival files, sometimes it shoots down your pet conspiracy theory. Uh, and in fact, this is one of the great benefits of openness and access. But of course, archives can also confirm your pet conspiracy theory. For example, in the 1960s, many people on the left believed that uh, B.A. Santa Maria uh, and his far-right anti-communist Catholic forces believed that they were working hand in glove with ASIO. Not only was this true and confirmed by archival documents, but even more surprising was another discovery that I made. This was the high degree of cooperation that existed between the New South Wales Labor right and ACO from the 1950s through to the 1970s. When, when people made this kind of accusation many years ago, I, you know, the, the Labor right works with ASIO, I must admit I was a bit sceptical about these accusations until I saw actual documentary proof uh, showing this, this went on. Later on, I interviewed um, the late John Ducker, who was a, a sort of godfather of the Labor right, and he personally confirmed to me that uh, he had a connection with a number of ASIO officers, they gave him information about what the left and the Labor Party was up to, what the Communist Party was up to in the unions, and so on and so forth. It was one of the more surprising things. Another uh, little conspiracy that, that I, I didn't go looking for them, they just turned up in the, uh, when I interviewed ASIO officers and, and then got files. In 1973-74, which is during the period of the Whitlam Labor government, a group of senior ASIO officers investigate, actually investigated the Labor Attorney General, who was their ministerial, who was the responsible for them. Um, so they investigated Lionel Murphy because they believed he was a possible agent of the Russian KGB. <laughs> this, this belief was prompted by Murphy's raid on ASIO in 1973 and by a series of wild speculations which included the fact that both of his wives had been born in the Eastern Bloc. Murphy was also under suspicion because he was a public critic of ASIO and had championed a series of left-wing causes. But of course, when you think about it, to do all that sort of thing publicly would be the last thing that a KGB sleeper agent would have done. It made no real sense, but they were so angry and, and, and outraged by Murphy's raid on, on their headquarters where he tried to establish uh, what information ASIO had about Croatian terrorism because of the impending visit of the Croatian Prime Minister. Uh, they were so outraged by that, they thought, well, this guy really must be something more than he appeared. Another hidden aspect of ASIO's Cold War history is the way in which the Liberal Country Party government used ASIO as a virtual private research service. They did this publicly uh, using ASIO information in Parliament to attack the Labor Party, but the more interesting stuff was what they did privately when they insisted that ASIO do security checks on their political enemies. Um, for example, liberal backbenchers, you know, the, most, the lowest form of life, one might say, <laughs> in, in, in Parliament, I mean, no, no, they, they drew no water, the backbencher is a, you know, very much a small potato in Parliament. Um, liberal backbenchers were able to go to the Attorney General and say, look, I'm very worried about a certain person in my electorate, I think they might be a communist. The, I don't know whether people remember, Jeff Bate, uh, Liberal MP, asked about someone in his electorate, a man by the name of John Hatton, who later became an independent uh, MP in the Griney years. Uh, and it turned out John Hatton knew the woman who was the secretary of the Waterside, was the administrative officer for the Waterside Workers' Union and so on. Now, all of this is in the files. and. This was, I think, most, the most outrageous stuff. The way that the Liberals in that period were able to use ASIO uh, through the, by making a request to the Attorney General uh, to see uh, this kind of stuff, or to be, have stuff confirmed and so on. There was even a Liberal Attorney General by the name of Ivor Greenwood, 
who insisted on seeing raw transcripts of telephone intercepts, that is, the actual conversations uh, by different people. At another stage, uh, he told ASIO officers, or he insisted that ASIO toughen up their threat assessments because he claimed they underplayed the danger of left-wing political violence. Occasionally, to its credit, ASIO resisted such blatant politicisation. And this occurred uh, in an episode in the late 60s when, uh, which concerned uh, the leader of the left, Dr Jim Cairns. In April 1970, there's a, a document that shows that Prime Minister Gordon's office asked ASIO for published references for, quote, any brushes with the law by Dr J.F. Cairns. The memo went on, the Prime Minister recalled an incident in 1956 at a polling booth, and apparently there was an argument at a polling booth, the police were called, and so on and so forth. Um, Gordon wanted this information, this file note said, quote, to be provided solely within ASIO resources, and no reference was to be made to the Victoria Police without his approval. So it was very much a sort of undercover request for information. And as I said, to his credit, that the then Director General, this was in 1970, then Director General of ASIO, Peter Barber, resisted and delayed fulfilling this request because it was very obvious, it was, it, all this occurred in May 1970, just before the first big Vietnam moratorium. And what Gordon was fishing for was material that would suggest to people that Cairns, who was the, the leader, in effect, of the moratorium, that he had he'd been in trouble with the law, he had, had a, he'd brushed up or assaulted a police officer or something, way back when, in order for, obviously, for, to, make, to give him political advantage, to give Gordon political advantage at this crucial time. Having said all this, uh, it's worth recalling the old saying in journalism, never let the facts stand in the way of a good story. I say this because as I researched ASIO, I began to find other things that were getting in the way of my story, or rather, getting in the way of my preconceived <coughs> prejudices. The problem was that one of the central reasons for the founding of ASIO was the need to identify and investigate Australians who were engaged in espionage to assist the Russians. I began my research thinking that the allegation that local Australian communists had taken part in Russian espionage was nonsense, designed to fuel Menzies' anti-communist political cr crusade. The more documents I read and the more people I spoke to, the more I realised that there was indeed a small group of secret members of the CPA who had in fact passed documents on to the Russians uh, from where they worked. The documents were in the old External Affairs, now Foreign Affairs Department. Such actions which occurred in many Western countries by members of the Communist Party who, intellectuals and so on, had gotten jobs in foreign affairs, helped precipitate some of the deep suspicions of the Cold War. So in the end, while ASIO had plenty of dirty secrets, the left had one or two of its own as well. The other thing I'd like to mention, just in closing, as, as mentioned also by Meredith, is just about current times. My research and all these anecdotes about ASIO come from the Cold War. And this was a very different time from at present. And I wonder whether it's legitimate to draw simple comparisons between then and now. Uh, my own view is that religious-based terrorism or terrorism of any kind is a genuine threat to security and a legitimate target both for ASIO and the police. For me, the issue today is not whether ASIO should exist or not, Rather, it's the nature and the strength of accountability mechanisms that you need when you invest a body with extraordinary powers to tap phones, examine computers, and all of those recent things. Thanks very much. Thank you.